might need to kick us off. I know he was at Tismo. Yeah, he was there. Okay. Uh, just give it about another minute. A couple of, well, we still got a couple of minutes here, I guess. So. Hey, Neville. Good morning, Keith. How are you? Doing well. I think um, looks like we're uh, live streaming. So whenever you want to start the meeting, uh, we may do so. This is Alan Danaher. Is everybody able to right. hear me? <clears throat> yes. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> Good morning and welcome to this Technical Advisory Committee Virtual Metro Plan Orlando meeting. I'd like to call this order, to, uh, I'd like to call this uh, meeting to an order this morning. My name is Nabil Mohaizen. I am with the city of Kissimmee and I'll be chairing the meeting today. Metro Plan staff is working to ensure this meeting runs smoothly. Today's meeting was advertised on Metro Plans Orlando's website <clears throat> and social media, as well as through targeted emails. The Florida Sunshine Law requires a quorum to be physically present uh, in a room for a government meeting. Governor, Governor DeSantis, however, had suspended this requirement in an executive order uh, last year with the pandemic situation, allowing government boards to conduct business using virtual meetings. Uh, this particular order has expired last year on October 31st, and so this meeting is being held in a workshop format. Uh, Mr. Kasky will be uh, explaining that a little further uh, in, the, in shortly. We will keep our microphones muted unless you've been recognized to speak, and we'll use the raise hand feature to participate in the discussion. There are two public comment points uh, in the meeting, members of the public who wants to speak, who want to speak, will use the raise hand feature found in, in, in the participants tab. If you're attending by phone, you can hit the star nine to raise your hand and request to be recognized. When you are called, your microphone will be temporarily unmuted and we'll ask you to state your name and contact information for the record. Uh, this brings me to, to a few comments that I'd like to share before we start this meeting and uh, announce a couple of things as well that I, I think would be beneficial to the group. Uh, first of all, uh, in our last meeting, uh, during our last meeting in February, on February 26th, uh, one of the presentations that was uh, the Mr. Alex Trauger has substituted for uh, Mr. Nick Lapp to accommodate our request uh, to sort of a host a discussion about the project prioritizing methodology that Metroplan has elected to use in the past few years. There was a lot of questions from the, from the members here in the technical advisory committee. And uh, we asked that we could, if we could shed some light on the process and they were good enough to uh, uh, do two presentations. One was in the format presentations, I, as I mentioned, uh, Mr. Trotter had done that in, as a substitute for Mr. Uh, McClapp. And shortly after that, which was uh, roughly a week ago, uh, many of you may have participated in this workshop, which I thought was very accommodating, uh, was done in a very prompt fashion. And I, I was left with the impression that everybody had a lot more understanding than 
uh, when the meeting started or the workshop started. A lot of questions I've answered. There had been a, a promise to continue uh, exploring this issue. Uh, Mr. Love had mentioned that he would be taking this up perhaps to Metro Plan Board uh, as he took an informal, uh, if you will, vote to see if any of us would like to go to the uh, previous methodology of, of uh, prioritizing our uh, construction projects throughout our region. Uh, second announcement I'd like to, to share with you is uh, a lot of you may have uh, received a, an email from uh, uh, Metro Plan Chairman, uh, Mr. Gary Hartman, and that was sent to most of us on April 1st. And that highlights the Pre President Biden's American Jobs Act. Uh, the memo goes into a lot of details on that. If you need uh, to look at that, it is available. We can send it to you. Uh, but the, uh, the bill basically provides an access of $621 billion that, uh, that is distributed in, uh, in various uh, areas of transportation, uh, water bill, housing. I don't wanna go through the details, but it is available for you to review. And uh, perhaps that could be a subject of discussion for us in the future. Uh, the last announce, announcement I have is, uh, is regarding this uh, Smart Growth America report that was released on April, I'm sorry, uh, February the 25th. Uh, and it's called, the report is called Dangerous by Design. I'm sure you've all have heard of it. And uh, I believe everyone has a copy of it. If you'd like to get another copy now, because I'm going to dedicate towards the end of this meeting a little bit of time just to discuss that and get some feedback from you all. Uh, so if you wanna look at that, by all means, please let us know on the chat box and we'll be able to email you a copy of that report uh, for your convenience. So uh, Mr. Mike Wilson will be doing a, a detailed uh, presentation about this report later on. I think it's gonna be, from my understanding, it's. It's gonna be very helpful for us to understand how this report is, is put together and what methodologies are used to, to present the final findings. So uh, be prepared to, to participate and, and enjoy that report. I think it's, it's, it's very beneficial for us, especially uh, being members of the transportation community that resides in this worst region in the nation, quote unquote, as they put it. Uh, these are all the announcements that I have. I'd like to uh, turn it over now to Mr. Keith Kasky for the agenda review. Mr. Kasky. Okay, good morning, Mr. Chairman and all the committee members and those attending online. Uh, thank you again for working with us as we conduct these virtual meetings. We always appreciate your patience and understanding with this. Uh, and based on direction from our board at their meeting in December, this meeting is being held as a virtual workshop in which action items that are being advanced uh, to the Metro Plan Orlando Board will be reviewed and discussed, uh, but no formal action will be taken so that a quorum will not be required. And the board's action on these items will be ratified in, at a future in-person uh, TAC meeting. And this format is subject to change if the governor issues another executive order. So again, thank you for your flexibility during this time. Uh, as the chairman mentioned, we'll be using the raise hands feature to recognize committee members uh, during the meeting and to call on members of the public during the comment time. If you joined us on the phone only without the uh, video screen, please use star six to mute and unmute your line. And please use star nine to raise your virtual hand so the meeting host can see that you wish to be recognized. And you'll see that there's a chat feature uh, on your toolbar and this communicates with all the panelists in the meeting, which includes committee members, staff and presenters. Please only use this if you are having technical issues or need assistance. And a, few, a full record of the chat comments will be included with the public record of this meeting. Um, also, there was an email that was sent out to you all uh, last week regarding the off-system construction candidate program. And I uh, just wanted to remind you all about sending in your candidate projects uh, by next Friday, April 30th. So these projects can be included in the new prioritized project list as candidates for funding. And then uh, Metro Plan Orlando will be conducting a market research survey from May 3rd to the 21st. And this will cover a wide range of transportation topics, 
and we would like for all of you to participate in the survey and we will be sending out more information on the survey in the near future. So Mr. Chairman, uh, that completes my announcements uh, and we'd like to take attendance and I'll ask Ms. Kathy Goldfarb to call the roll for the record. Again, there are no action items, so we will be able to move forward even if there isn't a quorum present. I'll ask all committee members to please go ahead and unmute yourselves now for the roll call. And you can go on mute again after your name is called. Please make sure your video is on if possible so we can confirm it's you. You'll find the unmute and video buttons on the bottom of left side of your toolbar on the bottom of your screen. Please say here or present when your name is called. How about Don Tuono? Anderson? Blackadar? Here. Brock? Carnes? Here. Cash? Here. Castro? Here. Clem? Present. Cornelson? Cornelson? DeVries? Present. LSR? Present. Friel? Gold? Here. Hammer? Hardwick? Here. Hawthorne? Richmond? Present. Jacobs? Here. Dredge? Here. Krug? Here. Moskowitz? Moskowitz? Nuhasen? Present. Stasi? Did you say Nastasi? Yes, I did. I'm oh, sorry. So I, I have to log out in about 15 minutes, but could you allow Brian Sanders to uh, be a panelist in my place when I leave, please? Thank you. Okay. O'Keefe? Present. Olori? Present. Rajai? Present. Pullum? Here. Rigby? Girinella? Present. Senorans? Present. Smith? Present. Sudemeyer? Present. Orp? Edie? Present. Walter? Present. Walton Wharton? Here. Williams? Williams? That concludes the roll call. Thank you very much for uh, the roll call, uh, completing the roll call for us. So we will now uh, hear public comments on what we normally call action items. As you've heard earlier, this is a workshop format. so. There will not be any actions taken on these items until further notice. But in this format, we will uh, uh, we will have people who want to speak to any of these items. Do we have any at this point? If I so, don't see. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. go ahead, Keith. Do we have any? Sir, yeah, uh, I don't see any hand raised at this point. Okay. In the event of that we do have, we will again use the hand raise function. Uh, using the star nine button on the phone if we are using a phone uh, and the public would be required to state their name and address for the record. Uh, are there any written comments, uh, Mr. Kasky, that were submitted prior to the meeting? Uh, no, there were not. Okay, great. That will take us to our presentation segment of this meeting today. And the first presentation is going to be uh, by Mr. Nick Lepp. We ask that you would use again the raise hand function to be recognized. You may raise your hand during the presentation to include, uh, to indicate you want to ask a question, but we will hold questions until the presentation ends. 
If you're having audio issues, you can type your question into the chat box. A moderator will relay the question to you. Uh, again, we'll hold all the questions uh, until the end. And at this point, I'd like to introduce Mr. Nick Lepp for your presentation on, uh, he's from Metroplan Orlando. Mr. Lepp. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, next slide, please. So you haven't seen this before, <laughs> but uh, over the past five years, we have presenting what we've called uh, board emphasis areas. Um, and these were emphasis areas developed by the board chair at first, uh, but then offered to the entire board uh, to help with the prioritization and to add a little bit more guidance to areas where they wanted to see some of the uh, project or funding directed. Um, so this started about four years ago um, after the last long range plan. Um, and that is because the 2040 long range plan, as I tried to explain over the past couple of meetings as we were talking prioritization, um, remember really only included a long list of roadway widening projects on the state roadways. So that's why we had calls for projects and other mechanisms as we were trying to develop the multimodal or off system list, as well as prioritization, trying to find where those performance measures and emphasis areas would go towards to help prioritize projects that really meet the goals and objectives of the region. Um, so at the time, the board uh, decided that the emphasis areas for prioritization would be for trail connectivity, um, engaging the younger population, which really isn't a performance measure that we use for prioritization, but just really an emphasis area for Metro plan, uh, complete streets, safety, and sun rail connectivity. So that's what we've been focusing on, as well as the other performance measures in our prioritization. Uh, next slide, please. Now, over the years, we've also been tracking how we've been doing with that. Uh, we wanted to see how those emphasis areas have helped derive where the, those TMA funds have gone towards and how well have we been doing over that time period in programming funds to meet those areas. So since 2017, we were about 52% of those federal TMA funds that we use to support those four programs we talk about so much, Complete Streets, TISMO, um, Trails and Sidewalks and Transit. Now up to just last year, we were about 93% of those funds um, being allocated towards kind of these emphasis areas. A um, little bit less just because there was uh, less funding in the tentative work program over this five year period than the last, which is why you see those numbers um, a little lower than say 19 to 20. Uh, next slide, please. We will give that a minute. There we go. Um, back one more, thank you. Um, so with this recent adoption of our 2045 um, Metropolitan Transportation Plan, we had five overarching goals. I won't go through these in much detail since I, we have probably inundated you with these over the past two years, but health and environment, safety and security, reliability and performance, access and connectivity, and investment and economy. Now, all of these goals have a set of performance measures attached to them, which we use in the prioritization, which was talked about by uh, our chair about the past couple meetings that we've been going over. Uh, next slide, please. So we wanted to draw an alignment between not only the goals that we developed during this 2045 plan, but also with those emphasis areas. And we found that there was quite a bit of overlap. So at the last board meeting, uh, we presented to the board the opportunity of instead of having an emphasis area um, that we discussed the really the goals of the plan each year during this time frame, and use that almost as a weighting component. Um, next slide, please. So Within there, we have, um, right now, you have a bunch of performance measures attached to each one of those goals. So if we were to rank those goal areas, we'll just use safety and security for an example, if that was the number one goal for the region, that would add more emphasis to the crash rates, the fatalities and serious injury rates, the numbers of pedestrians, and then the evacuation routes. Now, that doesn't mean that we are discounting the other measures. We're just adding a higher weight to say safety and security. And then what are the other categories that may um, need more weight uh, to advance projects within this next round of prioritization? Or, or really, what are the emphasis for this um, round right now? Um, next slide, please. So before we started um, the long range plan, we, we, we asked, uh, you know, what were the orders of importance for these goals uh, kind of pre-pandemic. 
Um, and as you can see, this was where they all ranked. And it was really less than a half a point difference. So as we were going through the development of the Metropolitan Transportation Plan and the cost feasible component of it, um, all of these goal areas were weighted equally. So what you see in your cost feasible plan and the rankings and how projects um, fell out into the plan period one, kind of those first uh, five years of investments, and then the second five years, all by neutral weighting. Uh, we're looking to introduce a weighting component to that just to reflect how things have changed or things do change over the course of the year. And we may need to add more emphasis in one of these goal areas to make sure we're uh, prioritizing those projects to meet those targets that we have uh, committed to, to the federal government. Uh, next slide, please. So kind of pre and post pandemic, uh, pre pandemic, number one was access and connectivity as well as investment to the economy. Um, but then you can start seeing how those um, sentiments changed uh, post pandemic. So with this, we kind of understand that uh, we may want to do this annually and see how things change throughout the year and, and use these goals to help um, emphasize certain areas that maybe needed to be done to prioritize projects. So um, next slide, please. And there should be a link that has just been dropped into the uh, chat or will be dropped momentarily that will allow everybody to uh, go in and actually rank the goal areas. Now it's just a survey monkey link um, that has our five goal areas and I'm gonna leave this slide up there um, for you to see which performance measure are attached to those goals. But what I'd like to do is ask you guys to rank these right now. It won't be a live ranking because um, we're using the survey monkey, but it will be happy to share the results with you of what the group thinks uh, sometime later on, uh, in maybe late next week, uh, once we get them all tallied. Uh, but we plan on using these as well as um, getting your rankings from the technical and TISMO advisory committees. We're gonna present this also to the community advisory committee and the uh, Metropolitan, the MAC, um, and really present these then, then back to the board and ask them to rank these goal areas and to see if we want to use a weighting criteria within this next prioritization um, to decide what those next projects are moving forward. And we were gonna give those boards the opportunity to say yes or no, if they would like to wait, but we'd like to hear from our technical committee also at the same time. So um, please feel free to click on the link and submit the survey. I'm gonna give you a few minutes um, to go ahead and complete the survey, but I'll open it up to any questions while people are completing the survey. And um, that's what I have for my presentation, thank you. Bill, I think you're on mute. I apologize. It's uh, it's always a given when uh, your lips are moving and you can't hear anything. But uh, I was just going to mention to the benefit of the uh, the committee that you can rank the same ranking for just about every one of them. You don't have to rank them in, in progress. Or did you want them rank one through five overall? We were actually looking for ranking one through five if you had one. If you have no opinion and say that they should all be ranked equally, um, actually, I don't think we gave an option on that survey, but feel free to email me and tell me, no, um, we think they should all be ranked equally. We're just looking to see where, uh, where things may have changed between before when we started the plan to after, and then really where we're going into now for prioritization, what is the thinking of our technical committee of what should be emphasized. Let's see. So it uh, looks like we have a hand up by Josh. Thank you. I was just wondering if you could uh, go back one slide so we could see the, the list yep. on the presentation. Looks like they're working on that. Thanks. Nick, I'm gonna wait for your cue to proceed once you get all the results you have. I won't, um, I won't know that the survey's open. Uh, feel free, I did get a message that it looks like the TISMO group doesn't have access if they're not. So I will uh, send this link out to the TISMO committee and allow them to uh, have an opportunity to rank if they are not, uh, if they don't have access to the survey right now. So with that, I guess uh, if there are no more questions, I will uh, conclude my presentation. Thank you. I look forward to see uh, how the rankings shake out.
Thank you very much, Nick. Very, very uh, uh, interesting presentation with the survey there attached at the end. Our next presentation is going to be on safety trends by Mr. Mike Wilson of Metroplan staff. Mr. Wilson, please proceed. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Um, so as, uh, as your Chairman noted at the beginning of the meeting, uh, the Dangerous by Design report came out just a day or two before our, our previous board meeting. And so we didn't have a chance to really re respond to that. And we got a lot of questions about the, uh, you know, about the report itself uh, and about our own situation when it comes to pedestrian safety. So because we have a lot of new members, not only in the board, but in many of our committees since last time we went over this, I thought it'd be good to pull together um, some refresher stuff as well as some more uh, detailed uh, information, both on the dangerous by design methodology and, uh, and our own crash data. So this presentation, I'll start off by talking about that pedestrian danger index and how it works and show you how, when we change our local numbers, how it affects our score. Uh, talk briefly about what uh, FDOT is now including in their safety planning, which is uh, the safe system approach. Uh, talk about crossing law because it's, it's an essential part of why, um, of how pedestrians cross the road is essential to our, uh, our problem. Uh, and then go, go into more depth into the, the crash factors, uh, you know, why we have the, the number of fatalities that we do and why they've been increasing. So the pedestrian danger index has three basic components to it. One is the number of fatalities, second is the population, and then it's the percentage of people walking to work. So you you divide the uh, fatalities by the population to get a, a rate, and then you divide that again by the walk to work rate. Uh, it's important to note that, uh, and you know, the numbers that I'm going to be showing you do not line up with the dangerous by design report exactly. And that's because they've been using uh, the, the broader metro area that includes Lake County. And so in order to show how our, our data when it comes to crashes and population really fits into the formula. Um, the, the, we're just using the calculation rather than their, their exact numbers. So one of the questions that often comes up is how does our visitor population factor into this? Well, we have roughly 200,000 pre-COVID, 200,000 uh, visitors in our metro area on any given day. And if we add those in to the uh, calculation, it reduces our pedestrian danger index by about 9%. But it's also important to look at how uh, this affects the crash side of things. And we actually have very few visitors who get into pedestrian crashes when compared to the, the overall population. You can see here only 4% of people uh, who are outside of the outside of the state of Florida involved in as pedestrian fatalities, uh, and for the two year period we were able to study that in more in more depth. Uh, this came from just a, a more in depth study that we did in twelve and thirteen uh, that we had zero uh, foreign pedestrian fatalities. And that does happen, but it, it is just not a, a significant portion of our of our fatality problem. The other thing that you could change would be to have more people walking to work, but of course you'd still wanna have <laughs> the same or fewer uh, fatalities. Uh, during the past 10 years, and uh, you're gonna see these groupings of uh, 2011 through 13 and 2017 through 19 uh, throughout the presentation. So you can kind of compare uh, all across the, uh, these different factors. Um, that we had about a 20% increase in walking to work, but that still gave us a 15% increase in our, our pedestrian danger index uh, because the crash rate was, the number of crashes was continuing to go up. Now, if we had doubled our pedestrian walk to work during that same period, we would have seen a reduction of 27%. It's only when we get to reducing fatalities itself that we're really gonna see a significant reduction. So here you see that if we reduced our fatalities by 20% over that 10 year period, 
that we would see a 42% reduction in, in the pedestrian danger index. So now I wanna move on into the, the problems and solutions. Um, recently, Florida Highway uh, Safety Plan was, uh, was put out by FDOT and they've included a new approach that they call the safe system approach. And I think this is a key point, which acknowledges that humans make mistakes and whether we are behind the wheel, walking, biking, uh, and that if we're going to protect people, we need to do what we can to take that into consideration and minimize that risk for serious injury. And we need to look at all the factors that are coming into play. And when we look at pedestrian fatalities, these are the, the four key things. Failure to yield is the behavior, but then they're predominantly happening at night. Distraction is increasingly becoming an issue. And of course, driver speed is a big part of it. Um, before I get into uh, how frequently this happens, it's important to understand what the rules of the road say when it comes to pedestrians and, and right of way. When pedestrians are crossing the road, they're permitted to cross mid block as long as the nearest intersection is not signal, as long as one of the nearest intersections is not signalized. So, in this circumstance here, the pedestrian is between a signalized intersection and an unsignalized intersection and would be permitted to, to cross provided they were yielding to traffic on the roadway. So, those yellow areas is where, there, where pedestrians yield to motorists. The green area would be the crosswalks where, where motorists yield to pedestrians. And then the red area, which is within the intersection itself is where pedestrians can't cross. And it's also uh, important to point out here that the crosswalk is not just paint on the pavement. It is the literal continuation of those lateral lines of the sidewalk across the roadway, which means most of our crosswalks are unmarked. But the law doesn't really differentiate between them. It just says when a pedestrian is in a crosswalk, Here's what has to happen. Now, when pedestrians are prohibited to, to cross is between adjacent signalized intersections. So here we see that the areas in red where pedestrians are not allowed to cross, but if we had a marked crosswalk at a mid-block location, then not only would pedestrians be allowed to cross there, but drivers would be required to yield. So getting back to this idea that well, humans make mistakes. So we've got three road users here who are getting ready to cross the road in some fashion. Um, and they all have to yield to that driver in the red car. You know, if, a, if the driver of that white pickup failed to yield to the driver of the red car, we wouldn't say you can't make left turns anymore. Although maybe at that specific location, yes. Um, and so the same goes for pedestrians. If pedestrians crossing mid-block and doesn't yield, we look at all the different factors that come into play. What is the lighting, the speed, the sight lines, all those other factors um, in order to manage this, this safety problem. So let's look into the factors of, of how these crashes happen. First off, looking at daytime versus nighttime. That you can see here that over the past 10 years, this is all of the increase has been um, nighttime fatalities. Now, so note the 14% increase in overall night crashes and only 6% for day crashes. Keep in mind that we that our population increased by 14% during this period. So we're really not making any significant inc uh, increase in crashes in the daytime. So when uh, pedestrians are failing to yield mid block, this is the even greater increase. So here we're seeing uh, an 84% increase in fatalities over the time period. So you can see that the severity of these crashes is increasing. It's not that the number's increasing, you see only 5%, um, and that's you know, less than the population increase. Well, if you look at the daytime crashes, that's, that's actually decreasing at both, uh, well, at least as a, as a crash type, it is increasing as a fatality. 
So pedestrians are actually doing a, a better job of yielding during the daytime, but not at nighttime. And so we, we should ask, why is that? Uh, another interesting thing that I found in looking in that is, is that uh, we would expect, well, gee, maybe we need to light the road better. But the biggest increase was actually happening on lit roads. You can see there are nearly 150% increase. Um, and so that's where the majority of our nighttime crashes, crash increase is happening. But pedestrian fail to yield as a percentage of overall crashes is actually going down. Uh, distracted driving, of course, is, uh, is a question mark. And so we're, we're getting better data on that. And so when we look at the crashes where it's the motorist failure to yield, and we see a, a, a more than doubling of that problem over the course of the year, I mean, over the, over the course of the decade. Uh, nighttime, uh, in general, pedestrian involved crashes up by 27%. And I added also to showing the uh, smartphone ownership increase over that time, which you can see from less than half to more than three quarters. Um, alcohol and hit and run, um, we see a decline in alcohol and drug crashes over the time period, but they may, that may be masked by the increase in hit and run crashes. So it doesn't really look like we have a, a real change in, in the alcohol aspect of it. And then looking at motorist failure to yield, here we're seeing an increase um, and more so during the daytime, uh, probably because it may be because pedestrians don't expect the drivers to yield at night. Um, yeah, you know, there's a number of things that could be happening here. It could be distraction. It could be that um, officers are better informed about the crosswalk laws and are more likely to assign fault to the driver. Um, and it could also be a little bit of perhaps pedestrians feeling a little more confident uh, because of some of the work that we've been doing with, with Best Put Forward. But um, anyway, it's, it's hard to tell why, but uh, something we want to turn around. Uh, this was from a presentation they did a couple of years ago. It doesn't include that entire 10 year period, but basically gives you the, the overall picture that this is a nighttime and speed problem overall. That 82% of our pedestrian fatalities where the pedestrians crossing the road um, are at night and then same number for on roads that are posted at 40 to 50 miles per hour. Which brings me to something that I've noticed over the years, and I've shared this before uh, with this committee and with the board. And, and that is that when I travel to other parts of the country, I routinely find myself on roads where I think, boy, you know, this would be a lot faster if I was back in Florida. And so here's one, one example with our, our local street on the top and uh, one in Montana on the bottom. And you can see the similarities here of, uh, although the Vista is wider, it's all of that width is mostly in the median. There's actually more pavement on the, uh, on the Bozeman street. And yet uh, that street is posted 10 miles an hour slower. A uh, similar case in uh, with Apopka 441 on the, on the top and Missoula, Montana at, um, on the bottom, a, a much wider road because it's got the uh, paved shoulders there for probably for snow storage. Um, and again, 10 miles an hour slower than our road. And then here's a, uh, an example of a six lane with uh, US 192 and Kissimmee on the top. And this road in Houston, which is actually an eight lane road, uh, a little bit more pavement uh, and yet, again, 10 miles an hour slower than, than ours. So I, I think we need to look into this a little more deeply and 
uh, try to tr make some of these comparisons, you know, not just looking at the width and, and number of lanes and such, and, but also get more detailed information about land use, block length, uh, other geometrics and see, you know, how, how is it that we are doing things differently or at least it perceived, perceived to be doing things differently uh, than other parts of the country. And obviously that 10 mile per hour difference is gonna be a huge impact when it comes to pedestrian safety and fatalities. So we have this you know, deadly trio of darkness, distraction, and speed that's contributing to our problem. Uh, there is one additional uh, issue that, um, that's brought up in Dangerous by Design, and that is the, the type of vehicles that are increasingly on the road that passenger regular passenger cars are not um, as popular now and that trucks and SUVs are growing in popularity. And you know, the, the front ends of those vehicles are taller. And so when they hit the pedestrian, they're more likely to, uh, with a passenger car, the pedestrian is more likely to roll up onto the hood and, and windshield, which is actually less uh, harmful. Whereas with a taller vehicle, the pedestrian gets slammed uh, to the pavement and also where the pedestrian is hit. Um, pedestrian with a passenger car is gonna hit, be hit lower down hips or below. Whereas a pedestrian hit uh, by a taller vehicle is gonna be hit in the, at the hips or, or just above. So you'll have a lot of uh, internal organ damage from crashes like that. So one solution that I've brought up uh, in the past uh, is this idea of just reducing speeds at night since that's where our pedestrian pro safety problem is. And we have a, an example of this here in Florida, uh, down on the uh, Florida Keys on US-1. And this is done to protect the endangered key deer. Uh, and the key deer evidently also have a difficulty at judging the speed of approaching vehicles at night, just like humans do. Uh, and so we get drivers to slow down to accommodate that so that when the, when the key deer makes a mistake, uh, it doesn't uh, pay with his or her, her life. So that uh, concludes my presentation. I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you, Mr. Wilson. Very interesting and informative presentation. And it's uh, very timely in light of the recent report release. Uh, I'm soliciting any question from Mr. Wilson on the presentation. See if we have any hands here in the box. Skaski, do you see any hands? I don't see any. Uh, there's uh, uh, Laura Hardwick. Uh, Laura, yeah. has raised your hand. Hey. Laura, you recognize, go ahead. Hey, I just wanna say thank you, Mike. Uh, I think that was a really great presentation diving into how um, our ranking might differ with different factors. I really appreciate that perspective um, and highlighting the speed and nighttime um, makes something that is a very big issue um, seem like we can actually make some progress towards it. So I just want to thank you for your work on that um, and yeah, just highlight that that was a really good deep dive. Thanks. Excellent point. Thank you for your comment. Any other comments do we have to, that you have for Mr. Mike Wilson? Chairman, this is Bill Wharton. Can I have a question? Yes, please. You're recognized, Mr. Wharton. Thank you. I don't, I don't have the, the raise hand feature, so <laughs> I'm blank on that. Um, Mike, the, the ped walk to work uh, figure, how is that determined? And, and can you, uh, again, how does that relate to the overall scoring? That comes from the U.S. Census, so from the American Community Survey. Uh, that, that's where it's pulled from, um, both in Dangerous by Design and, and what we pulled from. Okay. Uh, and, and then the way it factors in, it, you know, they're trying to get some measure of, of exposure and some, uh, as opposed to just population, right? So, um, and it's the only thing that's really available on a national level that's going to be consistent. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, any others? I see none. Oh, I see Mr. Chad Smith. Mr. Smith, you're recognized. Yes, thank you, Mike, once again for a good report. Um, can you uh, give this to everyone, the presentation? 
provide that? Sure. Or if not everyone, at least me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay, I see no other hands raised. So we'll move on to the, our next presentation for the day and it's our last presentation. This one is going to be uh, done by, uh, it's entitled Links Autonomous Vehicles and it's done by our TISMO chair, Mr. Doug Jamerson of Links. And uh, Mr. Jamerson, it's, uh, the floor is yours. Go ahead, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My name is Doug Jamerson and I am with the Links Innovation Department. Also presenting with me today is Alan Danaher with WSP. We'll be giving you a high level overview of the Lynx Autonomous Vehicle Study Project. Next slide, please. Lynx worked in partnership with the City of Orlando and Metro Plan Orlando during the study to develop a concept of operations, which examines the potential deployment of automated vehicles in existing or future Lynx transit services. A guiding principle in this study was that autonomous vehicles have to be able to meet the needs of the passengers and also transit services, but not changing services simply to meet the needs of the autonomous vehicles. Next slide, please. During this study, we have created a concept of operations document and also a draft scope of services that help us prepare for a future demonstration of automated vehicles. The concept of operations helps us to provide details on the anticipated scope and vision for the longer term incorporation of automated vehicles in link services. It helps us and future vendors to better understand how automated vehicles would be required to operate to meet the needs of links and its passengers. And the document also helps links and its partners understand the physical and the data infrastructure that is currently available along with any anticipated gaps that will need to be filled for the operation of the vehicles. I would now like to turn the presentation over to Mr. Alan Danaher, who will provide the results from the development of the concept of operations. Next slide, please. Okay, thank you, Doug. It's really a pleasure to be here today. I wanna to start by just uh, talking a little bit about the structure of our study. Um, there were nine major tasks that led into the uh, concept of operations and a demo scope for an AV pilot project. And it started actually back in 2018 when Lynx issued an RFI request for information for vendors to provide information related to the state of the art for automated vehicles. And they were small vehicle vendors at the time, but we started out in our study by summarizing all of the input received through that initial effort and then moved ahead and identified a, a number of uh, various activities, starting with the assembly of goals and objectives for the project and the purpose of an AV pilot project, moving ahead and addressing all of the different components that have to be addressed to assemble a concept of operations as well as a demonstration scope. They included things such as uh, workforce needs, risk assessment, looking at uh, uh, stakeholder coordination, what was the status with respect to partnerships and policies in the region to facilitate uh, operation of shuttles in the future, AV shuttles. Um, one of the things we did was to um, work closely with a stakeholder group that comprised links the city of Orlando and Metroplan Orlando uh, with respect to uh, having meetings on a regular basis, getting input on methodologies, on analysis, uh, recommendations and the like, all of the different uh, memos which were produced, nine of them in total as an input in to the concept of operations. Next slide. So one of the things that we wanted to do was to get input from the user community out there as a whole, with respect to how they saw opportunities and barriers related to automated vehicle application in the future, opportunities and barriers. So what we ended up doing was to create a small user focus group and that consisted of various uh, representatives from different user types. We pulled uh, to some extent off of the membership from the Metro Plan <laughs> Citizens Advisory Committee and the Transportation Local coordination 
policy board to um, serve on that focus group. And in addition to that, we reached out to all of the membership of those two committees with an online survey to get input. And this particular slide shows you opportunities and barriers with respect in order of selection frequency. On the opportunity slide, obviously, users felt that there's more flexibility provided with respect to automated vehicle operation in the future, more efficient transit, lower congestion, fewer vehicles on the road. With respect to barriers though, uh, constraints tied into driver assistance um, uh, with respect to the untested technology and the like, as well as security issues. Next slide. So um, one of the things that we wanted to find out was um, how users would actually apply the service. What would be their preferences with respect to the type of service that would be most attractive for them to take an automated vehicle shuttle or bus? And 90% of those respondents thought that the limo um, that's in place right now uh, within the downtown Orlando area would be the best fit for service. And this was followed by the Disney Direct and the NeighborLink services, as you can see. 60% uh, on, the, on the flip side thought that access lanes would never be a good fit for service by automated vehicles because of the, a lot of the special needs associated with the users of that particular service. And in general, 70% uh, felt that automated vehicles would be something that they would be attracted to with respect to using. Next slide. So we identified seven user types that um, we felt were important because everybody has certain needs with respect to an AV shuttle application, with respect to its basic layout, with respect to its basic operation, uh, with respect to station facilities uh, prior to getting on to a vehicle. But there are uh, different user types that have special needs beyond a typical user such as an elderly person, such as a visually impaired or hearing impaired or cognitive impaired, uh, smaller children or those with larger carry-on items, those that have a limited English proficiency, they all have specialized needs related to an AV vehicle in terms of its design and operation. And we address specifically how those needs would need to be integrated into an overall concept of operations. Next slide. So we looked at, in terms of the concept of operations, in two basic um, uh, operational scenarios. Uh, a small AV shuttle, which was the um, uh, focus initially of that request for information back in 2018, as I mentioned. Uh, uh, certainly that technology is, is available at this point in time. There's multiple vendors on the market that have partnerships actually uh, procure the vehicle and operate the service and monitor the service and the like. But there's a lot of operational issues still tied into smaller AV shuttles, such as the need for uh, in route charging and maintenance and a speed differential with respect to other vehicles. Uh, most of the small shuttles are operating at a speed of let's say 10 to 15 miles per hour uh, much slower than a regular bus operation. And they also have a limited capacity, most of them around 10 to 15 uh, passengers as opposed to a larger capacity associated with the existing larger vehicles. So what we ended up doing was to also look at um, what would be involved to retrofit an existing larger bus. Let's say one of the 35 footers operating on the limo system today or even a larger bus or a, or a, 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 a smaller uh, mid-sized van, let's say, and those types of things. That technology is a few years away. Only recently did one bus supplier develop a fully automated bus, uh, but certainly there's some possibilities emerging with respect to certain vendors providing retrofit kits that could be added to a traditional bus to actually make it an AV vehicle with some of the AV features needed to operationalize that type of service. Now, we did find out that there would be lower life cycle costs associated with this scenario, 
as well as fewer operational issues with respect to, it's gonna be a lot easier to retrofit a larger vehicle that's already in service as opposed to trying to intersperse in one or more smaller vehicles within that existing service. Next slide. So we looked at specifically what would be involved to, to do an AV pilot project on the limo orange line. And we looked at the orange line because it has exclusive lanes, limited interactions with other traffic, uh, special transit signal phasing at intersections, and it has the capability of having nearby charging infrastructure. Next slide. So this table shows um, a comparison of the operating costs related to three different pilot options we evaluated. The first one was to intersperse three small shuttles into the existing limo orange line operation, which would increase service frequency and reduce headway between vehicles. Uh, we looked at that option. We looked at an option of maintaining the existing um, uh, service, but then adding at the end a string of one or more uh, small shuttles with respect to what that impact would be. And then we looked at the scenario of retrofitting one of the 35 foot buses. And you, you can see here that existing Orange Line annual operating costs are roughly 1.7 million. And to do a one year AV pilot, the operating costs would range from half a million to 1.3 million. And we found in the end that two scenarios, either adding a single small shuttle or retrofitting one of the 35 foot buses uh, would have the lowest operating costs. Not shown on this slide, but there's also a need to address uh, what's needed with respect to the infrastructure improvements needed to operationalize an AV pilot as well. In particular, uh, network and traffic signal modifications in close coordination with the City of Orlando signal system staff, we identified a cost of about a half a million dollars, which would have to be added to these costs. So let's say to uh, add one shuttle in um, uh, to an AV pilot, uh, you would be looking at adding the uh, operating cost of 543,000 to the infrastructure cost. It would be about a million dollars to do that and about a quarter of a million dollars more to retrofit one of the existing 35 foot buses. Next slide. So this slide just highlights some of the pilot proje uh, project benefits, obviously uh, providing greater education to agencies and to the public on what is an AV operation related to public transit service and the like. Uh, certainly um, uh, getting insights with respect to testing and evaluation procedures and impacts. Uh, the, the service itself would um, uh, provide increased safety and efficiency over time in terms of a broader application, obviously, of uh, AVs within the region, economic development opportunities, uh, more efficient parking footprints, and a number of different things that were addressed in the Metroplan CEV readiness study, uh, as well as lower operating costs. But again, as Doug had mentioned, the focus here is that it would be Lynx's goal to provide transit service and how AVs would fit in. The intent is that it would make sense to move into an AV environment if the uh, service can provide the same or better service to all passengers uh, related to the system operation. Next slide. So there is a potential broader application beyond an initial pilot. Um, certainly in the future, AVs could be integrated into the Lynx fleet related to different services, pending the evolution of uh, AV technology over time. This includes, uh, uh, in addition to let's say application within the limo system in downtown Orlando, there's other downtown circulators or uh, short route circulators that uh, can have application for AV shuttles, particularly first mile, last mile service. NeighborLink is another possibility with respect to its shorter routes and its slower speed 
operation of its vehicles. And then in the longer term, if you can overcome the speed uh, differential related to uh, existing uh, regular bus service, let's say operating on 1792, if in fact AV shuttles could operate at a higher speed to maintain the competitiveness of existing local service on routes, then certainly applying AV application to those routes in the longer term could be appropriate. Next slide. So another thing that we did was to do a financial analysis and Infra Strategies was one of our subconsultants that led this assessment. And we did a comprehensive assessment of federal, state and uh, project specific funding sources. But as an input into that, we looked at um, uh, nine um, pilot projects that have already been implemented or in place around the US with respect to how were they funded? Uh, what were their characteristics and the like? And that was really helpful in uh, helping to provide a framework for what would be needed with respect to funding levels and sources that have been applied with respect to activating AV pilots in the short term. And again, uh, with respect to federal uh, number of different funding sources in total, federal, state, and local, we identified over 30 potential funding sources. At the state level, there's certainly an opportunity to do a partnership with FDOT. FDOT's already working with the University of Central Florida to activate an AV system on campus there. And certainly um, uh, there's opportunities with respect to a broader application of uh, uh, state involvement in the future. And it, as well as uh, project specific um, uh, uh, opportunities, let's say that there is an existing vendor that wanted to come in and offer to operationalize a pilot project in the short term for a relatively low cost. That could be attractive just to get the demonstration project concept off of the ground. Next slide. So to conclude, um, uh, future AV direction at Lynx will need to involve funding partnerships, obviously. Uh, Lynx provides the service requested by its funding partners. Um, uh, we've already put together a uh, demonstration scope related to possibly doing a small AV shuttle versus a larger AV shuttle demo. And that could move towards the development and release of a pilot RFP subject to the identification and availability of dedicated funding as well as the evolution of the technology advancements on the AV side. So that's uh, uh, just an overview of the uh, research which we've done for Lynx and uh, our stakeholders in the region in general. And again, the intent is obviously this is uh, really something that actually flowed out of the Metroplan CAV readiness study with respect to taking a further look at AV application at the regional level. Uh, that came out of that study that certainly this study feeds uh, added insights into into the future as the overall CAV applications are implemented in the region over time. Thank you, Mr. Jamerson. Thank you, Mr. Danhar. Appreciate the uh, very informative and very interesting uh, presentation that kind of brought us up to speed on the status of the uh, links activities uh, going towards automation. At this point, I'd like to uh, solicit any questions that anybody, anyone might have for the two gentlemen. Any questions? Okay, in an effort to keep the atmosphere lively, I have a couple of questions, if I may. Uh, Mr. Danhar, you had mentioned that uh, you are going towards or maybe implementing at some areas uh, a few vehicles that are completely automated. Uh, is that a true statement? Do you have any in service right now? If not, how many do you plan to have and when? Well, uh, 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 certainly any initial AV pilot that uh, Lynx and the funding partners would uh, implement would continue to have a driver on board, obviously, initially that uh, all of those AV pilots that are operating out there today in those small AV shuttles really have an operator there as backup. 
So certainly um, uh, the technology is in place to activate the operation of the vehicle, but there's always a driver there as backup. Now, over time, as the systems get more sophisticated and there's added experience, drivers ultimately um, will probably be eliminated. But again, that's longer down the road. That's on the small AV vehicle side. On the larger uh, uh, side, um, New Flyer um, recently, uh, one of the uh, larger bus providers in North America uh, developed a fully automated bus, larger bus, 40 foot bus for the first time that will be uh, uh, put into revenue service on the bus rapid transit line in Connecticut connecting New Britain with Hartford, which is an exclusive uh, transit way facility. Um, uh, uh, so the technology is, is starting to move in that direction. We had discussions with Proterra, who is providing the electric buses for limo. Um, uh, with respect to their 35 foot bus. And they're not yet ready either in the direct manufacturing of their vehicles or in retrofitting their vehicles to actually uh, provide a retrofitted uh, 35 foot bus on a limo system or anywhere else yet with respect to doing that type of a pilot. But certainly in a couple of years, that technology is quickly evolving where that type of a pilot may make sense to do. Obviously, an advantage of a larger vehicle pilot is, is um, uh, that uh, that would allow you in the end to uh, perhaps in terms of a broader application on neighbor link and uh, local bus routes, uh, regional type routes, as long as you can get over the speed differential issue um, uh, and have automated buses operate similar speeds to uh, existing buses. Uh, 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 so that travel time isn't penalized in the end. So it's, uh, Nabil, it's really rapidly, uh, rapidly advancing with respect to the technology. So uh, I don't know, hopefully that answered your question a little bit. And Mr. Uh, Chairman, just to add, uh, we wanted to get ourselves in a position to know where the industry is and where we are, so that as our funding partners are ready to move, so are we, and we're better informed. Uh, initially, it is not our intention to replace drivers because they do so much more than just steer the vehicle. So we wanna be in position that either if we do a demo or if a private company wants to do a demo, we understand what it is we're stepping into. Excellent, from a safety point, I appreciate both responses. Uh, I think it's understandable that for quite some time as this technology evolves uh, very gradually along with the uh, uh, infrastructure that's being uh, you know, prepared to accommodate, we will always, the assumption that there's always gonna be a driver if you wanna go any, any seriously uh, uh, you know, uh, reasonably speed that, uh, to maintain uh, traffic there. Uh, another quick follow-up on, uh, on the response that I just received. Uh, Based on the survey that you gentlemen have done, uh, have you have you have do you have any metrics that would tell you how many people would be willing to ride a Lynx bus that is automated uh, once you get that into uh, service? Well, I I I showed you on the one slide, Nabil, that uh, seventy percent of the survey respondents would um, welcome an opportunity to utilize an AV shuttle to try it out initially. So it was a pretty high number. Again, that was uh, the users uh, we had surveyed. Again, our initial user focus group plus membership of the CAC and the Transportation Coordination Board for Metroplan. In total, I believe we had about 40 survey responses. So it wasn't statistically significant by any means, but again, it gave us a pretty good sample of uh, what the trends would be with respect to attitudes on utilizing an AV system. An additional interesting, we did not ask this, but if you ask people, have you ever ridden an automated vehicle? A lot of people would probably respond they have not. Then if you ask them if they've ever caught a plane at OIA, ridden anything at Disney, Universal, or SeaWorld, then all of a sudden they realize they have ridden them. So sometimes not pointing out it's an AV 
Mm -hmm. is a little bit better than pointing it out and telling them how you do everything safe. And then they're worried about why you're telling them all that. Understood. Uh, last point that I have is since we're evolving into this process and obviously Lynx is very serious about that, just like all other transportation avenues uh, going to automation. At what point do you think that a massive educational or advertising of service would occur? I, I would suspect it should be at this staging point that we should be, you know, alerting the public that this is coming. I mean, us as a board here, as a, as a committee, transportation community, we're obviously aware of that, but chances are if you ask everyone in the room and, and how many automated vehicles do you know that are on the road today by what organization, I, I think very few of us will be able to name, you know, one or two. Bill, I think I think certainly, and Eric's, uh, I believe, on board. Eric Hill could uh, elaborate on this, but certainly there is a roadmap identified in the Metroplan CEV readiness study for that broader effort with respect to public education that extends beyond just transit AVs, but also just the connected vehicles in general, uh, as that technology really has evolved extremely quickly and 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 all that, but uh, yes, it is time obviously to proceed ahead and it provides more public education. Uh, people are already into purchasing new vehicles that have uh, connected vehicle technology. So we're already starting to get familiar with some of the systems that would be built into an automated vehicle shuttle on the transit side. Great. Uh any final questions for uh, the links, gentlemen? All right. Thank you very much again. Very informative. And thanks for being patient with our questions here. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. You are welcome. At this point, this, is, this was the last presentation of the day that we have uh, scheduled. Uh, so we'll move on to the items for review and discussion. And these used to be called our action items. We have two items for review and discussion today. Uh, the first one is the review of the February 26, 2021 meeting minutes. And the, you'll find this in your tab one of your agenda packet. Uh, the meeting minutes, I hope you, you all had had a chance to review them. Are there any corrections or revision that need to be brought to staff's attention at this time? All right. Here none. As a reminder, these will be brought back for a formal uh, approval at a future uh, in-person uh, meeting. Uh, second item is review of the FDOT amendment to FY 2020-21-2024-25 Transportation Improvement Plan. And you'll find this summary on your tab two of the uh, information packet that you have. And this will be presented by Mr. Keith Kasky from Metro Plan Orlando. Mr. Kasky, please proceed. Hey, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, this amendment includes three projects. We have the SunRail Phase Two North, which is in Volusia County. And even though that's outside of our region, uh, FDOT has requested that we include this project in our TIP since it is a, a uh, district-wide project. Then we have the four-laning project on Neptune Road in Osceola County. And that project is receiving uh, federal SU funds for right of way, and that makes it eligible to receive additional federal funding. And then there's a railroad crossing uh, project on Hester Avenue in Sanford. And as the chairman mentioned, uh, you all have this, this information uh, in your agenda packets. So with that, I uh, will open it up to any questions. Thank you, Mr. Kasky. Any questions for Mr. Kasky on the motion? Uh, Chairman Bill Wharton again, if I have a comment. Yes, you have the floor. Please proceed. Um, Keith, on the uh, the third item, the railroad crossing at Hester Avenue is actually an unincorporated Seminole County. Um, just one, not, not it really makes any difference, but just want to may want to make that correction. Okay. Uh, yeah, I mean, it just said Sanford on the letter, so I thought I'll, you know, I'll make that correction. So. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Any other questions for Mr. Kasky? All right, thanks again, Mr. Kasky. The next item would be uh, the TAC only presentation, which we have none today. So 
So we'll move on to the general information. Uh, there are several items under the general information tab, and this is tab four in your agenda packet. Feel free to review them. And if you have any comments in the future, you may uh, respond to, to us, uh, to Metro Plan staff, and we can include them in the agenda item. Uh, a couple of announcements on upcoming meetings. Our next meeting will be the technical advisory committee meeting will be held on May 21st. Uh, the next Metro Plan board meeting will be held on May 12th, not to be confused, 21st and the 12th. And that would be uh, a hyper, uh, hybrid meeting, uh, meaning the uh, Metro Plan Orlando board meeting where uh, some members will be uh, physically available in the, in the conference room there and others will be participating uh, via uh, uh, virtually. Uh, the one prior to the last item that I have in here that I kind of wanted mentioned earlier today and that is to sort of solicit some feedback on how you feel since we have a good coverage of the region. And when I was at the last Metro Plan board meeting, uh, this topic of uh, dangerous by design has, has really prompted a lot of response from the board members. A lot of them that usually, uh, you know, a lot calmer, but they were really passionate about this. As you can all understand, you know, we've, we've done a lot of uh, improvement to our region uh, throughout the the years uh, in just about every region. Uh, I do want to mention that this is just one report out of many reports, uh, you know, some of which are really good and others are not too good. So uh, with the understanding that this is not the final uh, word, if you will, on that, but I just find it, uh, you know, I'm, I'm basically want to hear what you have to say here as a group, uh, knowing that we have been you know, really active and putting miles and miles of sidewalk, enhancing safety throughout our regions. Uh, City of Kissimmee alone has implemented roughly by now 18 uh, uh, miles of, uh, of uh, trails, pedestrian trail and bike trails in the past five years or so. We're still continuing to reach up to 25 miles, the ultimate uh, master plan that we have. Uh, not to mention geometric redesign of the intersections, uh, FDOT is doing lighting across our region, you know, tremendous amount of spending, and it's all focused on the safety and the public safety and the pedestrian safety. Uh, not to mention last time we had uh, the best foot, foot forward explaining how they're also involved in our regions. And now we're, we're you know, thanks to Metro Plan, they're supplementing uh, their operation there, which is basically an enforcement operation to, to, to make sure this is done and enforced uh, and, you know, we're participating and now we're, we're even financially participating in that. That's how motivated we are. So in my mind, I just, you know, going to Mr. Mike Wilson's point earlier in the presentation, uh, there's gotta be another way to look at this. I mean, there's a lot of, I think, I don't wanna, I'm not, a, I'm not an expert on, on their report by any means, but I've read it a couple of times and it is, it does kind of, in my opinion, misses out or kind of unjustifiably uh, regionalize some areas. Uh, you know, our area is, is known for its, you know, rough weather in the summer. So how many people do really go walk, walk to work? We're not made that way. We're, we're an urbanized area for the most part with, you know, highways and so forth. While if you compare us to another congested city like New York or LA or whatever, where, you know, you haven't, a lot of times you don't have any options but to, to walk to work and do whatever. So I just want to throw this out for you guys to see what how you feel about that. If you have any feedback, I would I would love to hear it for the group. Anyone? Okay, Mr. Brock, go Nabil, please go ahead. Chairman, yeah. uh, Bill Wharton again. Um, we've been tasked to take a, a little bit deeper dive in this as well. Um, so once we get started doing that, I'd be happy to, to coordinate with you and maybe we can get uh, you know, some of the data from Metro Plan Orlando to help us out with that too. But I'll, I'll be in touch with you. Sounds great. Thank you. Mr. Brock. Um, in short, Nabil, I think I would disagree with your take on this. I think we should not take this lightly at all. Yes, we are trying, but we are not doing nearly enough 
I know the issue is not just our region, it's the way federal funding is structured and state funding. But when we're talking about billion dollar interchanges and then we're patting ourselves on the back for constructing two miles of trail a year, I'm sorry, we are not there. We are not built for the safety of people using bikes, transit and walking. And it's not just about deaths, it's about the everyday health of people by not having the legitimate choice to use active transportation to go about their daily needs. So I think we, we really need to not try to talk our, rationalize our way out of why we are number one. Does it matter for number one or number 10? We're awful. Um, so I think, I, I think we, we have to do more, we have to shift the focus and it really needs to be done at multiple levels. Good point. Uh, I appreciate your, your direct and honest response. I was not by any mean implying that we're, we're great. And uh, we all, I think, as professionals realize it, just as you mentioned, Mr. Brock, that there's a lot more to be done. However, all I was just focused on trying to get, get basically toot our own horn for the amount of things that we've done. And, they, you know, logically, it should make a bit of difference. I mean, is it a half a point? Is it a quarter of a point? But anyways. Food for thought. And Mr. DeVries, please, please, uh, you have the floor. Thank you. And, and I, I do agree that we, we need to continue um, working on improving safety for pedestrians through multiple uh, re uh, revenue sources and multiple projects, uh, such as sidewalks and trails and, and different TISMO projects. Uh, I, just, I just wanted to kind of highlight a few of the, the projects that uh, Osceola County has been doing uh, as far as sidewalk projects and, and not specifically the projects themselves, but an overall review in 2020 within Osceola County, uh, state and federal grant funds were used to complete construction of three new sidewalk projects and two new safe routes to school sidewalk projects. Design had also begun on two additional safe routes to school sidewalk projects. In addition, Osceola County local funds were used to design for more new sidewalk projects to improve the safety of children accessing their surrounding schools, as well as a, a highly used dog park. And then finally, the county applied for state safe routes to school funds for three additional sidewalk projects. And then uh, since then, design and construction of one of the safe routes to school projects, along with the assistance of uh, CDBG, of the CVBG program and the sidewalk to the dark dog park was completed. That was in late 2020 and design is nearly complete using local funds for two of the, the projects that I mentioned previously um, that were through the Safe Routes to School pro progress. And we are hoping to advance them earlier uh, using, uh, like I mentioned, local funds. And we also have a third Safe Routes to School project, which is slated for design in 2025 and construction in 2027. And lastly, we have five potential Safe Routes to School projects, which we're hoping to submit this year, pending uh, cost estimates that we're working on. And just overall, some of these projects include different phases. And I may not have covered everything out of the sidewalk that the, our sidewalk safety team is working on. Uh, but if my math is correct, that's that's 17 sidewalk projects, uh, safety projects in various phases of the process with uh, more to come. And uh, we, we also have several trail projects that include safety, um, several safety components for both pedestrian and bicycles, bicyclists. And I just wanted to kind of go over those and, and let the group know that um, Osceola County, as, as I'm sure I, all the other jurisdictions and municipalities that are that are part of this group are, are definitely working diligently to try to improve um, pedestrian safety and hopefully improve our score. Because I mean, one one fatality is is too many. So we want to do everything we can. That was all I had. Thank you, Mr. Dupree. Excellent point, and I'm sure each one of us municipalities can get on the microphone now and, and, and give us a bunch of stuff that they have done because we're all into this together. And uh, that's my point is just, what does it take to move that needle even if it has to move it one hair? Uh, it just, like I said, what we're doing has to show somehow. 
Uh, I know Mr. Mike Wilson, I wanted to let you go first, but your hand disappeared and then Laura, Ms. Laura Hardwick came up. So I'll take Laura and then we'll go to my, Mr. Mike Wilson. Laura, please proceed. Ms. Hardwick. Okay, we'll go to Mike. And I'm but, sorry, can oh, you hear me now? I can my, hear you microphone wasn't plugged in all the way. Um, I just want to reiterate most of what Mr. Brock said. He took the words out of my mouth. Um, I think it's worth looking at the data. What uh, Mr. Wilson showed us going in that deep dive is really helpful, um, but the way we'll move the needle is with the safe systems approach. That's what other cities that have already moved their needle are doing. Um, and there's a lot of resources out there with it. It's hard work, it's an uphill battle, um, but we can, I, I truly believe if we continue to challenge each other um, and not ignore the, the, the environment that we're building and how it can be unhealthy, I think we can, can get there, so. That's just what I have Thank to Thank you have. very much. And I agree, totally, totally agree. And I appreciate the spirit of, of wanting to do something about this and taking it seriously. Uh, Mr. Mr. Wilson, uh, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, yeah, I just wanted to see if there's, uh, I, I, would, I would hope there is some, some interest in some sort of working group uh, among the, the committee and perhaps bringing in some, some members of other committees as well so that we can uh, not only dive deeper into the data to get a clearer picture of, of the problems, but also uh, do more brainstorming on, on the solutions and uh, uh, to, to really focus on where, where the real issues are so that we can be effective. Great point, Mike, and you took the words out of my mouth. Actually, uh, the as you know, uh, Metro Plan Board has, has elected to continue to study this and and until another meeting and one based on what I've heard from Mr. Brock and uh, uh, Ms. Laura, uh, obviously there's, there's, a, there's a motivation in the committee to kind of let everybody know where we're at. So how do you guys feel about maybe putting together an ad hoc committee that would come up with a report and I could take that report to Metro Plan to, as a formal response from technical advisory committee, whether you wanna say we're in trouble or whether you wanna say we're gonna be better in 10 years, I don't know. How do you guys feel about that? Yes, Mr. Barton. Okay. All right, so we'll have a committee of a minimum of three people. Just report to us what you, what either the direction, we'll have like a, what we call a steering committee that you could give us the direction where we need to be heading and perhaps have a, a, a simple response, whether it's, we'll continue to look at that. Uh, we expect to start, you know, getting at, or accomplish this, uh, you know, goal by by so many years or by so many funds, whatever you want to do. So I would. Uh, do I see your uh, Mr. Kelly Brock? Are you raising your hand to be the chair of this ad hoc committee? Yes, you're muted. Not the chair, but I would love to participate. <laughs> well, you need to participate after this passionate response. Absolutely, you're not off the hook. I I would check that, Nabil. I think that was a good idea. Thank you, Mr. Walton. Walton. So that'll that'll relieve some of this uh, the the work on your own. Any any other volunteers, Mike? You want to volunteer? Well, I, I was just suggesting that uh, those who want to volunteer contact me, and I can uh, okay pull everything together. We need one more person before we start naming people to volunteer to be part of that committee. And this is basically a discussion, and you'll come up with a simple response. This is what we plan to do. That's all I'm asking. This is Laura Hardwick, I volunteer. Thank you, Ms. Hardwick, appreciate that. So Ms. Sikaski, you got that down. Okay, Ms. Hey, Hardwick. Ms. Pemberton, I'm sorry, I raised my hand, but I guess you couldn't see me. I, we've had four fatalities in one small area in the last year. And um, based on Mike's presentation, where I learned quite a few things, I would like to be on that committee too, because I'm, I'm feeling very despondent about not being able to do anything about the problem that seems to be creeping up in Apopka. Excellent. All right, we'll add Ms. Richmond to the committee members. So we have four now, and I have uh, Ms. Rachel Granola. You want to? You want to? You have? You've been recognized. Please go ahead. Um, 
Yes, this is Rachel Gerinella, alternate for Christopher Schmidt. I'd like to also volunteer. Excellent. So we have five members. I think that's plenty of members for this committee. And uh, you never know, we could really be making changes, especially with representation on the Metro Plan Board and all of our constituents and our uh, leaders on that board are, are listening and paying attention to this issue. So which will translate ultimately to funding. Uh, we'll proceed to the final item on uh, our agenda today, which is public comment. If any members of the public wish to comment, please use the raise hand function and you will be recognized or dial star nine on your phone keypad and you, we will unmute your mic after you have been recognized. Please state your name, address for the record and limit your comments to two minutes. Are there any comments at this time? Mr. Chairman, I don't see any uh, hands raised. Thanks, Keith. Uh, were there any written comments that were submitted prior to the meeting? Uh, no, there were not. Excellent. Well, it's been a very interesting meeting. I appreciate your feedback and your diligence and your attention. I wish you a great weekend and this meeting is adjourned.